Hey there, everybody. Good to see you. We welcome you to the first ever Industry Talks Back to Business. Um, as you'll notice today in the bottom right hand side, we are helped by SEMA Pro, that is the Professional Restylers Organization Council as part of SEMA. And today the topic is Rebuilding Partnerships and Operations. Uh, my name is Josh Polson. Um, I have a shop in Columbus, Ohio called Auto Editions, and I serve as the pro chair elect right now. So we appreciate you joining us. Uh, over the next hour, you're gonna see some of our industry panelists who are gonna discuss some of the strategies they've used to implement um, some of the safety concerns that are going on, how to get th things back to business, and maybe their retail showroom, and even working with the car dealerships. So um, one thing we're gonna point out is on your screen, You'll see an ability to put in a question, so we will have some time um, besides our predetermined questions and topics that if you want to put in a question, just type it in there, send that in, and we'll try to get to as many of them as possible. So we appreciate that. Uh, a couple quick things we wanted to share with you. Some We got some new SEMA statistics uh, back from market research, and it's talking a lot about all of our shops and what is going on and how everybody's feeling. And I thought a couple of these I wanted to share with you that are pretty cool. Uh, it says many companies expect to recover quickly and finish this year strong. So hopefully that's you too. It says 42% expect their 2020 sales um, to end up better than or similar to the 2019 sales. So for the third and fourth quarter. And then it says nearly 90% say they're mostly business as usual or the, the short-term impact, um, they'll be able to get through it. Another one is 46% expect their Q3 sales to be better than or the same as 2019. And then that number jumps all the way up to 50% think it'll be better in Q4, so that's great. And then one last one, 70% of you are confident about your company's plan moving forward. So we're here to help not only the 70%, but also the 30%. So we wanna get started. I wanna introduce you our panelists. Um, we've handpicked four experts from around the country our first expert is Bill Murphy. Um, Bill has a shop in Middletown, Connecticut, so East Coast guy. Uh, he's been in the business 32 years, even though he's only 34 years old. So that's pretty amazing. <laughs> Bill, welcome. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, I appreciate the time and, and uh, the opportunity to talk to you people out there. Um, so... I've been in the business for 32 years. It's, uh, this is probably one of my most challenging points in my career. Um, it's difficult, it's weird, it's uncomfortable. I not only manage the whole operation, I also do the sales and communicate with uh, customers and go on the road and try to promote products. And it's, it's a challenging time. It's a challenging time for all of us. If you guys are out there and you're feeling uncomfortable, it's normal. It's a normal feeling right now. Yeah. Well, we appreciate it and we look forward to your uh, your expertise, especially as long as you've had your shop. So our next panelist comes from South Florida. That's Christina George. Um, she's with Specialty Automotive Treatments. She's been in the business for 10 years and does a lot of their sales. So we want to welcome Christina to the panel as well. Um, and we're going to get, especially right now with all the flare up in Florida, that's on the top of her <laughs> mind. So Christina, welcome. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you. I'm excited to be here with you guys. Thanks so much for having me. Um, I think we're going to have a really good conversation today about all of the challenges that we're going through, you guys are going through, and hopefully we can all feel a little bit more at ease with a good game plan going forward. So thank you. Awesome. Thanks. And as you can see, Christina's sporting the pro uh, shirt today. So she is a representative from our select committee. So we're glad to have her helping us out in this way. Our third panelist uh, hails from San Antonio, Texas, uh, Diana Brashler, uh, owner of Dealer Source. They have a shop not only in San Antonio, but also Austin. So we always love to have as many ladies as we do guys on the panel, and we have two of the smartest, and Diana is a marketer. So welcome, Diana. We appreciate you taking the time for us. Well, I'm so excited to be here, guys. I mean, this is quite the honor, and uh, yeah, we're going to have some amazing conversation. I think that um, if people need 
sometimes to reach out and support each other, and that's that's what pros about. Yeah, so excited you. to be here. Well, we're we'll, we'll looking forward to tapping into your 24 years. And then lastly, <laughs> we have uh, Manny Mancata. Manny comes all the way from the West Coast right now, so we got him out of bed to get up and be on our panel today. Uh, Manny is. Uh, owner of Auto House Automotive Solutions, does a lot of retail and dealer business out there, been in the business 34 years, and he got in when he was about 60, so he's uh, so he's got a lot of experience too. Manny, welcome to the panel today, buddy. Thank you, Josh. Appreciate you uh, asking me to be a part of this. Really looking forward to it. Cool. All right, well, we appreciate you guys again taking the time. So one of the, one of the things that are on a lot of people's minds today um and we're hoping to hope to get some questions in here but i really want to touch base and see you know as a business owner you've had everything from maybe shutting down to getting back to work all the employees you know these health guidelines are still constantly in our ear on the news so how are you staying informed with the latest regulations and requirements um of what's going on uh manny maybe we could start with you how are you keeping up to date with what's going on, especially in California? Well, I'm pretty fortunate. You know, it's a family owned business and my sister's taken over the operations of handling that division. And when there's a question we have, she digs into it and she's really keeping our entire company up and running as far as the regulations and how we're supposed to keep our stores and customers. So we're really leaning towards Michelle to to guide us through this, and she's finding all her information at the um, you know .gov website for California, and um, you know presenting it. We meet weekly every Thursday. We're meeting and discussing what needs to what we need to follow. Yeah, awesome, Diana. You said you mentioned you guys are meeting weekly too, right? Yes, we have what we call pillar meetings. And uh, the pillar uh, comes from, you know, it takes pillars to, you know, form a foundation. So on that, we have an unpack of pretty much everything from daily operations, costs, employees, and then, of course, safety. And safety has been at the top of the list, especially with Texas. They were one of the first states to open up. And uh, we regressed a little and new new rules are in place. So yes, the .gov helps out a lot. Um, understanding what counties are affected and then understanding, you know, how we react to when a dealership calls and says, hey, by the way, that car that you just picked up, the customer tested positive for COVID. How do you handle that? Yeah. Yeah, that's it's a lot of, a lot to juggle, isn't it? And that's so, so weekly meetings I hear is a, you know, that's, that's a good idea, especially to make sure that everyone's in line so that we don't get too laxed. Uh, but Christina, you mentioned an interesting app that you found uh, that could actually help all of us. Uh, yeah, I did. I found an, an app that you can download. It's called Citizen. Um, it's more for individual people than for businesses, but it's really helpful because you put in your location and it will start giving you updates on, you know, what's going on with whether it's COVID or, you know, if there was a crime nearby, but the nice thing about that is we're kind of in this situation where we're going from, you know, we, we deal with three counties, as many of us do. You know, in Palm Beach, we have to wear masks all the time. In Miami, maybe just in a business. Um, so kind of keeping up to date with that so that we can inform everybody and, and stay, you know, on code, so to speak. Yeah. yeah. So there's a lot of information. Um, is there anything, let me ask you this. Is there any specific, are you guys looking at more statewide or are you looking at more um, countywide or citywide websites? Manny, where, where's, the, where's your sister getting most of her information? Give it a second, one second, Manny, there you go. Yes, definitely more for the county. Okay. Uh, we're right in between city and county, so she's both looking at uh, both of those regulations. Where we're at right across the street is the city where we're sitting we're on out you know on county yeah good okay so that's good information i think for shop owners and our members out there is just keep up to date um don't go off of what the media says go off what the what the actual officials are saying 
uh, more so. Hey, Bill, let me ask you a question. You've had your shop in Connecticut for a long time, very well established. What's one of the changes that you've had to make in your shop um, that you believe has made all the difference in reopening back up? What have you had to do to change things around as our second question is? Well, of course, we're doing we're doing everything as far as the safety things are concerned, as far as wearing masks, um, wearing gloves, keeping keeping the guys, letting them be aware that if they have to get in a car or vehicle together, it's important they have their masks on. Um, you know, space them out a little bit. Their work areas are spaced out a little bit more efficiently. Um, we're disinfecting every vehicle that comes into the shop. Um, the one thing I want to point out is one of the worst enemies you can have in your shop right now is a rag. If guys are using a rag to wipe, you know, just hot spots and stuff down, a lot of times a rag will have sand deposits and stuff and start collecting dirt. So these are things you don't want to start wiping on the big video screens and stuff. So what we actually do is we're actually using uh, air guns and we're putting in an atomizing, uh, you know, any kind of disinfectant for the vehicle versus rubbing or touching um, a rag like this and also go from one car to the next. If you're not really cleaning it properly, you can bring a virus from one vehicle to another. So very important to keep everything clean. When you're bringing a car in then, so you're going to pick up a dealership's car or a retail car, so you're you're disinfecting it before you guys work on it? Uh, or we when do you're have our well, our drivers carry, you know, the sanitized towels that are in little packages. You just and you can wipe the. The problem that I see in an industry-wide problem is using the alcohol-based products on everything in the vehicle and constantly wiping with alcohol. I think that's going to pose a problem for the future, and we're trying to avoid our guys from, you know, you could touch a knob or whatever. Don't wipe down screens. Trying to avoid wiping screens and touch panels. My drivers, um, you know, they're we inform them. Try to stay away from, you know, worrying about the radio and tuning in your favorite channel while you're driving, especially if it's touch panel. We don't wipe wiping on touch panels right now. Got it. Very good. Manny, Great. what, uh, I know you you deal with some retail, but then of course all your dealers too. What have you had to change in your shop, uh, especially being in California where it's been very strict? What we've done is we've closed off our retail entrance to our store. Uh, if somebody wants to go into our retail, we'll take one customer with the sales rep inside. We um, also moved uh, a tent and chairs outside, so no waiting, but if they do have to wait, we've got a tent, chairs all spaced out, allows our customers to stay outside. Unfortunately, we've also had to um, close down the restrooms. Uh, can't have any of the customers inside there. But everything's posted, everybody understands. We really haven't had the situation where disgruntled customers, they know what's going on. Yeah, got it, good. Um, that, I think that, that tells a lot of people, and have you got any negative feedback from customers because of all this, or are most of your customers understanding, Manny? When we first opened up, um, you know, it was on a slower pace. Um, we had the signs out and customers were coming in and they weren't wearing the mask. And, you know, all of our employees were. And so it was just a matter of conditioning our employees to hand mask out to the customers. They wanted to come in, they had to have a mask. Um, we had a few people that walked out, but that was at the very beginning. Now everybody knows you've got to wear the mask to enter anywhere here in California, you have to have a mask on. Got it, very nice. Christina, what what about you guys down there in, in Florida? Um, is there, what changes did you, how, were your employees able to quickly adjust to some of the changes or were there some challenges there? Uh, you know, there's a challenge and I think a lot of us have probably been around these people or maybe are one of these people that just don't wanna wear the mask um, and we have to have uh, weekly shop meetings to kind of tell people like this isn't going away. It's a constant reminder. You got to keep your mask on. And it becomes a little bit, um, you know, redundant when you have to tell the same employee to put their mask back on. So that's always a challenge. Um, and getting people in the rhythm of, you know, 
sanitizing the touch points and sanitizing the door. You kind of have to almost babysit that process for your safety and for your employee safety, because it's easy to forget that we're going through this when you're working throughout the day and you're busy. Um, so I think mostly just, unfortunately, babysitting right now people and constantly reminding them that even if you don't care about yourself, if you're doing it for you know the greater good of everybody else here. Yeah. What about you, Diana? What's been a, kind of a challenge to just to adjust to this whole thing? Well, you know, Christina's right. There's a lot of babysitting. Um, I like build techniques. And in our case, I'm kind of like a bad example because I don't like wearing that mask. But as soon as a customer does walk in, I put it on. And, you know, our employees, we gave them the nitrate gloves so that every time they touch a car, I said, you know, as soon as you're done with your seat and it's back in the car, throw those gloves away and start over. So every Monday, we hand employees two masks because you can wear them for three days. Uh, so every Monday we're handing employees masks and we're handing them, you know, gloves. And um, we've also got the sanitizer stations, you know, in the back as well as in the front. And we have someone that does, you know, twice a day, not a lot, but we don't get a lot of walk-in business. Uh, in Austin, we do more in San Antonio, but in San Antonio, we actually uh, hired a bunch of kids to do nothing but wipe down all the surfaces. Nice. Very good. So there's one thing we threw up here on the screen that SEMA put together, which I thought was really nice because it's professional looking. It's uh, it's an industry standard that we could all utilize is, you know, if you want to make masks required or optional or even asking about vehicle sanitation, like sanitization, like Bill mentioned, um, these are available to everyone. Just go to SEMA.org backslash reopen. You can download a zip file. You can print these out, laminate them, do whatever you want, and um, and and utilize these. I just I just printed some out today for our shop, uh, so take it full advantage of that. And that kind of goes along with one of our questions that came in, and maybe I'll just uh, pose this over to you, Bill. Um, we talked. It's it's from Holly, and she talked about returning to work. You know, uh, CD say, CDC is saying we can use either the test-based or symptom-based, and it would be nice to know what other companies are doing, especially since we are now finding out that employees can test positive for months with those symptoms. What are you guys doing as you return to work? Uh, maybe you can think about that for a second, Bill. I, I will say for us, you know, we're taking temperatures every, every morning um, when people come in. We buy a nice one where people just walk up to it, it immediately spits out their temperature. And like Diana said, masks and gloves. But uh, are you going anything besides that, Bill? Go ahead. Right now, I don't know if you guys can hear me. Yeah, we can. Okay, good. good. Um, well, right now, what we're doing is, you know, we're just asking our employees to be vigilant as far as how they're feeling. If they feel sick, don't don't come in and tell us you feel sick. Give us a call and explain what's going on. Um, if you do feel sick and it is symptoms of COVID, um, please go go get tested. Um, we really don't want you back until you actually have taken the test. Um, it's very difficult right now, um, it, and it's very hard to judge. How do you go about as a company, and what is your procedure? Ours is basically, if you're not feeling well, stay home. Uh, we can't monitor and take temperature every day of employees. Uh, personally, I don't, I don't believe that is, is going to be to give us an exact uh, measurement if they are ill or not. I'm not a doctor. Um, so, but I, I tell the employees, we have a talk to them. Listen, guys, if you're not feeling good, um, Please stay home, you know, and it's hard to judge because I guess the younger people and we do have a staff of a lot of younger people that work for us. Um, they, they don't have symptoms, so yeah. they don't have fevers. So it's, it's very difficult. It's a very difficult time right now. And I and I mean, listen, at the same time, right, we're running a business. So you right. can't just overreact and say, OK, well, you know, we all might have it. So let's just stay home. You know, people still need to pay their bills and we have an obligation to our other employees. 
Um, so yeah, it's a tough situation. I think it's a, I think it's a, each one has to make, each shop has to make their own decision. And what might work for Bill may not work for Manny. And what might work in California might not work in Florida. So I think uh, hopefully that answers your question, Holly. Um, let's go over to, let's talk about some dealership. Let's talk about business. Um, what approach have you guys taken with your dealer partners? And maybe Christine, I'll get your thoughts first. You know, to build confidence to the dealerships that they can trust you as a professional shop to keep doing business in a safe way. What have you done? Uh, there's a couple of things that uh, we did, and uh, I think that the industry is kind of moving in this direction because of this, um, is pick up and delivery at customers' homes. Um, and I know that's more work, um, but there's a way to kind of make that a blessing in disguise because when we're getting orders, we're now asking, obviously, for the customer's contact information and their address so that we can do this contactless delivery with them. And we're able to have more of a conversation with the customer as far as maybe upselling them any particular product and whatnot. Um, letting the deal, and, and really it's mostly letting the dealers know this is an option. Um, we are doing this because of that, because they've had to adapt as well. So you wanna make sure that they know that we're going above and beyond. Um, and, and really also it's, it's taking a while to get certain orders processed and product. So having that conversation with the customer and letting them know you're working on it, I'm gonna follow up with you. That's been really important to our dealerships. Um, the second thing is we are just wearing masks all the time. My sales reps that go out to dealers, I'm not really trying to have them play around. Like, is it okay here? Is it not okay? Um, and we've made that known to our dealers by giving out flyers. This is what we're doing. You know, everybody is wearing a mask, not just my reps, but the people at our shop. We're disinfecting touch points. We're social distancing. And very similar to the fly uh, to the to the download option that Seema just put out on the previous slide, handing that out to dealerships to make them feel comfortable. Good. I, I'm no doubt that's being successful. Diana, let me ask you the same similar question. How are you? How are your dealerships over? How are they reacting to this whole thing? How have you been able to maybe ease their sense of responsibility when they're giving you customers' vehicles? Well, in in a sense, um, there are delays with with dealerships, and what I'm finding is just trying to get the vehicle from point A to point B. A lot of these customers flake out a lot, so um, the disinfecting part and when the when our guy goes uh, and picks up the vehicle, they're they're wearing gloves and they're wearing masks and uh, you know, when we get it here to the office, the guys in the back, they're running, you know, contrary to Bill's, uh, re, you know, suggestions, we are cleaning, wiping them down with a rag. Um, so the Dieter confidence there is just, you know, consistently showing up with masks, consistently telling them, hey, you know, we can turn this or we can't, and setting up the right expectations. Um, because there are a lot of delays in our in our in our pipeline as far as production is concerned from our manufacturers that they're used to a faster turnaround and nowadays everything is blamed on sorry guys covid you know so our supply chain is, is limited in certain items um but overall i think that the dealers are in the same page you know that we are we we've, we've had to just they understand because they're going through it too yeah manny let me ask you a follow-up to what diana was saying there how have your have your dealerships been understanding with the delays or have customers in general that are buying these new cars? It seems like we know the car business, they've been selling a lot more cars than they thought they were. And now there may be some delays because of some of the stuff we're doing. How have that, how's that relationship been going with them? Similar to uh, Christina, uh, we've been actually working with the customer directly. Um, when we take it off the dealer's hands, you know, we're communicating via email with the with the dealer. Look, the customer's been aware. It's two, three weeks out to have their leather done. Um, they appreciate the fact that we're keeping them in the loop, but we're working directly with the customer. The customer knows exactly what's going on. So everybody's been pretty understanding. I haven't really had any issues with delays. Good, good. Bill, let me uh, ask you, a question because when it came to mass you made a comment the other day that even if a dealership is being laxed 
how do you and your sales force react when walking into a dealership? Uh, we still, we walk in and I try to create the atmosphere of uh, communicating with my dealership customers similar to be prior to COVID. Um, most people want to get back to normal. Um, it's good to be, it's good to be uh, considerate of everything that's going on, but um, you know, after the small talk and everybody, uh, you know, there's plenty of it because everybody's experiencing the same things we are, uh, whether it be a car dealership or a local grocery store or something, everybody feels uncomfortable. So um, getting back to business um, is what dealerships want to do. So we do bring in ideas. We are not pressuring the dealership for a showroom car, but we are making suggestions and talking about inventory that they have and what they can use and what kind of products we can provide for them to help them move those vehicles. Good, excellent. So that kind of leads me into another question here. Um, and maybe I can go back to you, Diana. With what you're offering to the dealerships now, how has that changed? Um, have you created new packages because of all this? Um, how has your whole offering shifted? Well, certainly there's very limited inventory and what I'm finding our salespeople doing, which is super mega awesome, is just the the power of suggestion that they're going to make more growth. And what I'm finding is that, um, I mean, we're going to finish out June super strong uh, despite the limitations in inventory and everything. And, and that's really encouraging. And dealerships do want to dress up because there's hardly any vehicles left out there. So some of our customers, yes, they're saying, yeah, please. I mean, right now, every Palisade that this dealer group is getting with cloth, they're sending them to me and, and getting the tech stitch package on it, which is awesome. Uh, they don't have a lot of Palisades, but they're going every single Palisade because we're adding growth to our vehicles. So that's encouraging. Um, so that is, um, did I answer that question correct for you? Yeah. So is there any, what packages, and this can kind of be a question for all of you to think about, Besides, like you mentioned the Palisade, what other packages are hot right now, even though the pandemic's going on and everything like that, what else have you been successful with? So in my world, um, because it's, again, what, what's out there, what's built, that's what we're going for. So prior to COVID, um, we brought in close to 100 leather kits that we are able to just you know, put together and our tickets are a little bit bigger because now, you know, suggested selling a bundling, you know, this leather package on this F-150 STX, you know, with a bed cover and giving it a special look. So, so things like that are, are working really well for us. Good. Manny, what you mentioned, uh, what do you have going on that's real hot right now? Prior to uh, COVID, I had brought in several um, of the new Advent 10-inch tablets and we'd That's hit the streets fine. yes we'd hit the streets and you know for a good two days it, it blew up and um since uh we've been in lockdown we have seen more dvds coming out of our stores than we ever have more and more people are traveling uh versus you know taking the plane. So the entertainment in the, in the uh, vehicles, you know, that's something to be inspired right now. Good point. What about you, Christina? Have, have you seen that same thing? Um, not specifically with tablets, but I think that- I you live in Florida and everybody comes <laughs> to you guys. Nobody, you guys don't travel anywhere. But anyway, go ahead. Sorry. It's too nice outside to be in front of the TV. Um, I think my, my advice, I guess, would be just getting, finding out what the dealer's pain points and weaknesses are. You know, in my market, which might not be the same to, you know, anybody else, you know, none of my dealers have accords with leather. Um, so that's a really good uh, void that I'm able to fill by talking to one, two, three dealers and then letting everybody else know, hey, do you have accords with leather? Um, you know, used cars is a big uh, market right now. These dealers can't get new cars from the manufacturer, so they're having to buy used cars. Now that's a whole nother challenge, um, but, you know, Di like Diana ma mentioned, making suggestions. You know, if you get a used car and with bad tires, um, 
let me present you an option to put wheels and tires on that vehicle because just to just replace the tires is going to cost you money. Let's make money on this car now. Um, and having those gross conversations and suggestions by asking them questions, you know, what are you as a, as a dealer uh, missing right now because you're not able to order X, Y, Z. Oh, good. What about you, Bill? What's, uh, what's been going on in Connecticut? What's been hot up there? Obviously inventory's tight, so we know. Inventory is extremely tight. Um, it's starting to evaporate every day. Um, I go back to the old school way of doing it. Um, walk the lot. Don't walk in with a promotion for a car dealership or a customer and start pitching something they don't have the inventory for. You may think it's the greatest thing since sliced bread and how hot it is and how cool it looks, but if they don't have the car, you just walked in and you're going to get nothing. Um, do your research, do your homework. Sometimes it's better to do your homework outside before you walk in. Yeah, no, I think that's a, that's a great point. Got it. Cause you can only sell them what they have on their lot and it is a good opportunity. I mean, we know that these dealers are holding gross right now on the cars. And so we know over the next few, maybe month or two months, they have to make as much money on each car as possible because they're not gonna sell the volume of cars that they have been. So the only way to do that is to add something like what we're offering to them. So if that customer really wants that car with our add-ons, they're gonna make good money. So kind of going at it that way, it's, it's a different, it's a totally different game than when they're mass volume and we're just trying to get a piece of that. Um, yeah. Let me ask, ask a question. Um, and Bill, I'll throw this at you. This is from one of our, um, attendees she they say i've noticed that there are a lot more options for car buyers including online ordering and having cars delivered to their home how does it affect your business if customers aren't coming into the showroom how can we work with dealerships to ensure these virtual customers are seeing their customization options well that one is extremely difficult um that's that's another challenge um that we've been trying to approach for years. I mean, that would lead me into our retail store. Um, you're going to have to do more online marketing, more marketing through um, the website and trying to get that customer to your retail store. Um, if you don't have a retail store, it's gonna be extremely challenging to get accessories. It's, it's almost as though we're getting cut out of the loop in that, in that environment. Um, but people still want accessories. They still want that car customized. So hopefully they're in your neighborhood and they circle back around to your business, to your retail store. And the only way they're going to look you up or find you is the same way they look for that vehicle. They're going to go online. So I say really be strong and get your website dusted off. If it looks old and it looks tired, make the investment, put the money towards it. Make it look sharp. Make it look who you are. Let them see what you're all about. That's the only way you're going to get them back. Very nice. Very nice. Anybody else have a thought on that, on what we can do to for our customers? Christina, can we get your thoughts on that? Um, yeah, I, I agree with Bill. It's, it's very challenging, and we've been dealing with this for a while. It's just kind of like amplified now. Um, but one thing I'll suggest to you guys is um, meeting with BDC. A lot of times uh, the BDC department at dealers don't even know that some of the stuff that we offer is an add-on. And let's face it, even though the customer is shopping online, uh, they're still gonna get contacted by a sales representative at some point. And the conversation I have with BDC uh, departments, you know, in meetings and whatnot is, you know, you probably have a list of customers that you called or you had hot in the deal that were at a $450 payment. Let's now swing them to a base model vehicle and offer them whatever you know whatever that premium model had or whatever it was that they needed to have on a base model and see if we can get them down to that payment having those conversations with bdc departments is pretty strong because they it's not like they're like yeah yeah i get it i know they have no idea that we do this stuff they're just sitting there on computers all the day all day long so that would be my biggest suggestion um i mean i was really focusing on that even before this but now it's it's unnecessary just to just set up a meeting buy lunch or breakfast go in and talk to these bdc guys absolutely and yeah. share them share them the success stories 
Diana, let me ask you a question. So obviously you do a lot of preloads. How does preloading, do you think, how could that help when it comes to customers that aren't, that are just to express checkout? Um, what is something you do with your dealerships after you've done a package? Do you make sure that dealership retakes the picture and post it on their website or what other marketing material do you do to help the dealership out? Well, unfortunately, no, we don't get them to do the retake of the pictures. I mean, what a great idea you've got. Um, however, you know, for us, showroom cars are becoming lesser because of inventory. Uh, I mean, but that's just for now. In the future, we, could, we expect to get back to, you know, what our original uh, basics were. And that is, yes, when you push showroom cars, that will increase your sales over your sold business, et cetera. But we do want to market our, you know, we, we put the banners on there. We put the danglers on there. We do the rearview mirror hangers on every single car, every single time. You know, we do the DOT stickers on the door. So it's just remarketing, remarketing our name. Uh, when customers send in their warranty card to us, we're putting them in our CRM. And that way we can go back and then remarket that customer altogether. So in these types of times, when you do have those virtual uh, customers that everything is done, you know, via email and then delivered to them. We do what you guys do. We, we pick up and deliver at their house. We try as much as possible to make it easier on the dealerships, especially because most of the dealerships in my area have gone to an every other day shift and they're still operating with minimal staff. So I might have my after guy there only on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, which limits the day that their customer can come in. So that's why we try and get that information as much as possible from them so that when it is their day off at the dealership, that we are able to just take care of business for them. And that way, when they come back, it's just easier because you take those days off, you're going to be behind. Um, so that's pretty much it. I mean, keep our name out there. We developed these postcards that talk us about the, you know, the dealer source app. And that we are going to just riddle all the salespeople's desk, the BDC, the service department, and anyone that can, you know, download an app. And it, it's an exciting time because we are kind of reemerging in a very positive, fun way because we have to rebuild it in our new vision. Yeah, good. I think it's going to teach us all a lot. Um, you know, between the five of us, Manny, let me ask you a question. I mean, we all, between the five of us, we have. I don't know, a thousand, couple thousand dealerships that we're touching. What do you think, what are you seeing the trends right now? Because I don't want to put the cart before the horse. What do you, are you seeing um, a mass, maybe all of you can answer this. Are you seeing a mass amount of express checkouts like they're getting delivered or are people still coming into the dealership? Manny, what have you seen? Um, I would definitely say there's still a lot of online ordering. Um, you know, I have visited the stores, um, just picking up and delivering cars, just to kind of get a feel for what's happening at the dealerships. So, you know, as, as far as that end of the business, it's still, for us, a lot of online ordering. I don't see a lot of people on the lots. I just don't see it. So, fortunate for us, our retail has definitely picked up. Um, we're doing a lot of utility um and truck companies with security systems um we're right in a in an area where they have rallies and um you know we're seeing more and more of these truck companies adding security systems to their to their vehicles so you know although the car dealer business for us is not you know booming um our retail is definitely has picked up anybody seeing the diff a different perspective i know with us it just seems like a lot of our uh, a lot of our dealerships are still having a ton of people come in um they're wearing masks and they're protecting uh what are you seeing down in texas diana is it a little different than california are people no not? actually i just had that conversation with one of my subaru general managers and during the month of march april he says yeah pretty much all their deliveries were you know, at the customer's homes, et cetera. But today, dealerships are full. Um, now with this new, 
you know, Texas, again, was one of the first states to open. Um, but with the, with the new uh, rise in COVID, I'm seeing a lot more um, a lot more limited amount of people in the showroom. Uh, service departments, they are still super busy, but the customers are staying in the car. So I see different dealerships with lines going out and then they're, you know, they're doing like the, like the Chick-fil-A drive up kind of thing, <laughs> you know, so, so it is a little bit different in the way our business is, is approached, but I firmly believe that we are going to consistently transition back to where we were based on, on the relaxation of the customer. So, yeah. And we'll, we'll keep going digital and it'll keep growing, I think, but I think the masses, I think it's not going to be a heavy mass. I think you're like Diana said, it'll come back where a lot of people will still be in the showroom, but there will be a bigger jump than maybe without the pandemic. Bill, what are you seeing in uh, Connecticut? Are people flooding the dealerships over the last month or two? Um, well, I'm in Connecticut, Josh, so nobody floods anywhere here. <laughs> Yeah, it, it, it's barely, it, it, barely it's, in the U.S. <laughs> it, the traffic count is definitely down um, uh, as far as the volume in the stores. But people are still in the stores. Um, and surprisingly, when you go into it, when I've been in car dealerships and walking around and talking to my guys, the customers still want to come in. They still want to feel the car they're buying. Uh, they want to go over all the features. They want to learn about the vehicle. Um, they're not out of the loop. They're coming back in. And, you know, shockingly, uh, what I've seen is the older folks, those, you know, the ones that should stay out of the market and stay safe at home. They're the people that are in the dealerships, uh, walking around, checking out cars and like everything is fine. They got their mask on and they're good to go. Yeah. Hey, Christina, let me ask you this question. Uh, when customers are in a store, are there as many tire kickers you think right now, or what are you hearing from your dealerships? Um, no, and I think Manny just mentioned it in the chat, which is, and I was just saying it's so true. Customers who are there are there to buy a car um, because, you know, what's the point of going out to a car dealership to, you know, potentially be getting COVID or talking to car salesmen, which are so much fun, um, if you're not there to buy a car. So, it's kind of has that rainy day uh, syndrome where I always say when it's raining, if your customers are coming in, they're, they're not tire kickers, they're there to buy a car. Um, but one thing I actually just wanted to mention um, in talking to all you guys, we all have kind of said our retail business is up. Um, and it kind of just put a light bulb off. SEMA has this great sheet that really breaks down percentages of accessories, how it's a $40 billion industry and it kind of goes down this funnel. And at the end of it, it says that dealers only capture 10% of that accessory market. I think it's 10. Um, yeah. The sheet's available on, on SEMA Pro site. Uh, it makes you wonder if, you know, a lot of these dealers who are still selling cars, if we're getting that retail business. And if you want to maybe have that conversation with the dealer and say, listen, you know, not for nothing, but our retail business is up show them that flyer and and remind them that they're not capturing that audience and we might be, you know, getting it for them. Just a thought. Absolutely. No, that's great. In fact, uh, what's shocking about that statistic is we usually do that every year. SEMA provides that for us. That 10% is the highest it's ever been. You know, it's yeah. been down as low as 3 4%. So 10%, the dealers should be ecstatic they're getting so much. We look at it as pathetic, but, you know, they right. they're actually up. So, uh, but no, it's great points that you have that. Um, so you can go to, uh, as you mentioned, you can go to SEMA.org backslash pro, and we have that sheet on our pro page there that you can see it's a great way to take it into your car dealership. Um, and without getting into product specific, because you know we're this is for the industry, we're not trying to get into um, actual products or manufacturers, we're not trying to do advertising for anybody specifically, but one question that came in that I'll ask you, Manny, because I know you've had some success without naming your product. Uh, you started offering interior long-term surface protection products. Yes, I missed your what? question. You missed it? So what? what is it, How? why'd you get into it without saying what brand you're using and everything like that? Why'd you get into it and how's it going? 
Well, before COVID, I had looked into this product and looked into being a distributor for this product. And then when COVID hit, you know, we shut down for, for two months and I probably took one week off and I just started texting all my relationships and asked the dealer owners, principals, what they were doing to disinfect their vehicles. And instantly I was getting responses back and forth of, yeah, what do you have? What do you have? And so it blew up. Um, I put it in dealerships all over the Bay Area. Um, General Motors authorized the product I'm using. So that really helped. Uh, when our store opened up, we now offer it inside our store. Um, before the customer leaves, the simple question, would you like us to sanitize your vehicle before you pick it up? And the sales guys get into what it does and uh, it's been very successful. And there's a few different ones out there. So, you know, for all those that are attending, you know, look it up, do your research. But right now, whereas maybe dealerships or customers might have balked in the past about sanitizing their vehicle, this is a great little quick add-on, whether it's retail, uh, we've had some success with it, but especially at the dealership level. So uh, definitely check that out. Um, let me get on to our next question. And again, keep those questions coming through if you're attending. Uh, today, we're, we'll be happy to try to get it to as many as we can. What did you find out? And maybe I could uh, ask this of you, Christina. What was the most challenging for SAT when you guys had to reopen? And how'd you overcome it? I mean, when you and your brother were talking about reopening, or I don't know if you ever even closed down, but what was the hardest part about that? Um. I would say the hardest part about reopening, believe it or not, is that, you know, we did have to, even though we were never closed, we did have to furlough about 90% of our employees. Um, so the hardest part was just bringing some of those key people back. Because if you furlough, um, or lay off or whatever, uh, a really good salesperson or an employee, they're going to look for a job because that person wants to work. They're not going to sit on their thumbs when they're home. Um, so we, we did lose um, two salespeople actually between the furlough and bringing everybody back. Um, and then also, you know, with, with bringing everybody back under protection of PPP and all those things, there's really not a lot of work to support them initially uh, or to support their time, I would say. Um, you know, so people are getting paid to do half the work that they normally would. Um, so, you know, just coming up with shop projects, cleaning the shop and, and giving people work that it's not busy work, um, but it's not necessarily um, from the normal day production of what we do, they might feel a little diminished. And I think that was my initial concern, but building it up as a team and we all kind of became a little bit more like family after it. Um, but just re retention, I would say, was our biggest issue. Good. Diana, let me ask you a similar question. I mean, you've got two shops located, you know, right, not right next to each other, you know, a little bit of distance in between. And I know you've had to, you know, juggle a few things around. What's been the biggest challenge for you since kind of reopening or post COVID big scare when you guys got back to business? So one of the things that um, COVID did, and there's always a silver lining in my world, um, regardless of what comes down, you know, that might look ugly for everyone else. So I always look for, for the positive. So the bad part was that, yes, we lost some key people that were really important. The good part is that we lost some people that I needed to lose anyway. So that's that. So then there's the reemergence plan. What is it going to look like when you come back? And we were able to just look at the company as a whole and say, okay, guys, what did we do wrong in the past? So you kind of get this, you know, this blank slate. Although we never closed down our San Antonio store, we did close down our Austin store. But even our San Antonio store, I'm like, Christina, I mean, we furloughed everybody. I was left with just myself, my husband, and, you know, two other, uh, three other managers and two installers. So 
that was all we had. And we were still pumping cars out. But the question was asked, what are you going to look like when you come out? And, and we always want to look amazing. So we were able to take a look at the structure that we used before and then say, this is how I want to look now. And we, we reshuffled people, got rid of some others. And now our structure looks a lot nicer, whereas before, maybe I was a little top heavy in some areas. So COVID was able to shake off some of the top heaviness, you know, and then restructure the people that we have to work with and come out looking stronger. So I'm really excited about that. Yeah, not only not only were you able to shake it off, but it's not financially hurting the company by shaking them up either. Ah, um, so. Bill, let me ask you a similar question. Um, what was the most challenging for you guys up there in the Northeast? Oh, sorry, I missed it. it was what was the what was the most challenging thing when you guys had to reopen, and how did you guys overcome it for you and Matt? Uh, well, you know, we applied for the PVP loan, so like most guys did. Um, so as soon as that money came available, we brought everybody. You know and kept everybody back um you know like to diana's point there were a few people we just didn't need anymore um because of the volume the shortage of volume and you know we are operating more efficiently um but you know we didn't we didn't actually make ready work for them we guaranteed them 40 hours a week um you know we spent every dime on our employees we made sure our guys were fit make sure they were taking care of them. And we, you know, we had a good communication with all of them, had big meetings with them and explained everything that was going on and explained how we had to apply for a loan and where the company was going, what direction we were taking. Um, so it was, a, it was a difficult time. It was a scary time. We did, you know, as business owners, you know, once your business turns, the switch turns off, you know, your immediate reaction is, okay, let's get rid of everybody and let's start, you know, let's figure it out and let's stop today. And, you know, you, you go to pull the fire alarm and say, that's it, but you can't do that. So we, we took a step back, we took a breath. We said, okay, let's calm down. We're gonna, we're gonna work through this and we're gonna make sure, uh, you know, our family, they're not just employees, they're our family. They take care of us as much as we take care of them. So we make sure our family and our people we're fed. They have people. They have kids to feed. They have responsibilities. So um, we did the best we could, and that was probably the most stressful to, time to deal with for us. Yeah. You know, I think this will. We'll look back on this, and we'll kind of like what we went through in 08, 09, right? We'll look back, and the lessons we learned then, we couldn't really apply in this case. But these are totally new lessons. So, like uh, Diana said, there's a silver lining in this, and what doesn't kill us makes us stronger, right? So. Uh, let me, uh, we only have about a few minutes left. And so let me finish with this question and I'll get each of your thoughts. Uh, starting with you, Manny, what do you see for your business? Maybe wholesale retail, however you want to break it up. I don't care. Um, what do you see over the next 90 days and what do you see long-term? What, what do you, what's your feeling? What's your thoughts? Well, my, my feeling, first off, I was surprised when we first opened, how busy our store was. I was shocked. Um, my biggest fear right now is what's going to happen in the next 90 days because COVID is back on the rise. Um, so, you know, I haven't seen the surgeons in the dealer business. I see it in the retail business. So it's still, you know, as a business owner, it's the unknown. So, you know, I'm just... You know, when I brought everybody back, it was like, you know, I don't want anybody stressing. I want everybody to know they have 40 hours of work, just like Bill. Um, I never seen the uh, laughter in our shop. There was just, just everybody was happy to be back. Um, and I think it was just bringing them back. I stayed in communication with them weekly, making sure everybody was safe. But again, moving forward, you know, it it's an unknown. Yeah. yeah. What about you, Christina? What's your thoughts on that? I mean, how do you think your next, obviously inventory's tough. So maybe the next 60, 90 days might be a little bit tough until dealers get cars, but what's your, what's your feeling for the future? Yeah. Um, 
you know, I kind of, since, since April, I would say you kind of see business start to creep up, creep up. Um, and I think, you know, July is going to be, unfortunately, probably a more difficult month for us just because inventory is going to start to, you know, right now we're going out and we're hearing inventory low. Um, my fear is that July, we're going to go out and hear, you know, there's no inventory at all. Um, so I think we're going to kind of take another little bit of a dive and then hopefully, um, hopefully after that, we'll be able to really start getting going because, you know, those people ultimately are going to be holding out for the brand new car that's coming, you know, the 2021s, and then we'll see an increase in business. So my feeling, and I'm, you know, I'm not like, a uh, anybody that has a crystal ball is that it's going to dip down a little bit and then really spike back up, um, at least that's what I, I hope it does. Obviously, there is a lot of uncertainty right now. So it's kind of an unknown. It's just a, a kind of a gut feeling of how business is going to go. Yeah. Um, and Diana, let me ask you, what do you think? What What do you think is going to happen in Texas since they only buy trucks down there? I mean, you guys even know what cars are? Uh, sometimes. We try and convert the truck back down to a car. <laughs> no. Christina, I, I firmly do believe that we are going to, I mean, we our, our last meeting with our salespeople when they were taking a look at their numbers, um, they're close to goal. They're worried that July isn't going to get goal for them because of inventory. So I'm, I agree with Christina. I think that July is going to be a tough one for our salespeople, for the company, and for our installers. I'm relying more on retail to try and keep the installers busy for that. Our retail business, you know, has been just steady pushing along. Um, so July, according to manufacturers, Toyota just started producing more Tundras for us, which good thing. Ford is making more of a commitment to give us more of their best sellers, which are of course the F-150, F-250. Um, and, and those commitments, they're talking about delivering late July, early part of August but they're still, you know, facing the same problems that we have, COVID cases on the rise. Um, but I think as a country overall and the availability for personal protection is, is better, and I think that maybe perhaps um, that will ease people's minds some so that the businesses can get back to business. And, and that really, like Christina and Manny said, there's a lot of uncertainty, but we have no fear. We know that this is a strong industry and you've got to be excited about that. What do you, that, that, those are all excellent points. Uh, Bill, anything to add to that? You know, what you think is going to happen short term, long term? Um, I agree with everybody, all the comments they've made as far as uh, inventory levels. It's going to be tough in the next month or so. But this is who we are. We are, we are the people that, you know, make customers happy. There's going to, if we got to work with used inventory, it's not going to be as easy as it was. We're going to have to walk the lots, look at what people have. We're going to have to communicate with the dealerships, you know, send out email information to them, get them aware that, you know, we are the people to go to. When that customer looks at a used piece of inventory, uh, it doesn't have a feature that they want, don't turn that customer away. Give us a call. Let us know, hey, they're looking for leather. They're looking for a sunroof. They want, uh, you know, they're looking for blind spot detection. Um, you know, as Christina said, you know, she doesn't have a crystal ball, neither do I, or anybody on this panel. But I think uh, it could be challenging. It could be exciting. And, uh, you know, it's we got to work a little harder. That's all there is to it. But I think we'll all be here. And we're all coming back. And we're going to be stronger for it. Uh, well said from the 32-year vet. 33, here we come. So thank you all very much. You guys are awesome. You guys are all at the elite, what I would call elite restylers in this business. And that's why we wanted you on here. Um, we wanna thank everybody, all of our attendees for coming in. Uh, we will be able to share this today um, to you as a recorded video that you'll be able to download and watch. Uh, SEMA is gonna be hosting a number of these industry talks in the weeks to come. And for if we didn't get to your question, we'll try to send out something in a member update. We may even do some polling, you know, and give some people some overall percentages on what it, where people's sales are at and how many of their employees are brought back. I think that could be valuable information. So uh, 
make sure you go on to, as you see there on the website, SEMA.org backslash reopen for some of those documents we talked about that might help. And any of the questions, you can send them over to Denise um at her email address and then of course our website that has a lot of pro information on there we have our sales exam um we have the, the documents christina mentioned at sema.org backslash pro so we appreciate all you guys and all the hard work of the sema employees for getting this put together so until next time this is saying goodbye from sema pro thank you thank you